when I took this uh, 300 TDI out for a test run the other day after I did the uh, power steering pump and customers complaining that the discs were wobbling or the pedal was pulsating should I say so I've put the dial test indicator on here put a little mark on the disc to see where we are uh, I checked the other side and that was okay but look what happens on this side See, there's a slight deflection see see there so this, the disc, this disc is warped I just wanted to show the customer that so I'm going to pull it to bits now as you know I'm not looking forward to pulling this to bits. Why? Well, I've got to take the caliper off. Normally I just pinch the uh, the brake hose here. But this is fitted with those stainless air equip hoses and I can't pinch it. So what I'm going to have to do is undo this, the, the pipe here at the back and make a cap to go over the you know, and plug up the pipe so we don't have fluid everywhere so it just looks like I'm gonna to have to pull all this lot to bits now he was saying that there was a sort of a wheel bearing so you know something I bought brand new kits to do this job with so I'm gonna pull all this lot to bits and we're gonna do wheel bearings and rotors and pads I'm going to do a while as a matching set and then it's done and it's out of the way. So I better get on with that then. Getting the caliper off is quite easy. Like I say, first of all what I've done here, I've put in a little male to, uh, female adapter on here, like a connector, put a bleed screw in and then onto the end of the pipe so that's nice and uh, non-drippy. Now there's some spline on the 300 TDIs. There's a 13mm spline, however, I, I use a 12 uh, a half inch uh, 12 point socket in order to get them off because the 13 seems to me to be just that little bit too big. So here we go. Let's see if we can get this off. <clears throat> Usually there's no room to get a bloody uh, an air gun in. There's not much room at all to work. There. So I'll get a ratchet and then we'll take that off. I keep knocking this pipe. I should really take it up the spanner. Anyway. Once the bolts are out, then we can take the caliper off. It's really easy. I'm not even going to take the pads out yet. I'm going to do the pads on the bench. Now, that's what I was saying about the uh, 12 point star uh, head. Fits lovely and snug on a half inch, a little bit loose on a 13. Next, we take the caliper off, like that, put it to one side, and leave it so that the, bleed, the, the uh, pipe is at the top and plug it if possible. The next thing we're going to do, if you probably noticed anyway, that this hasn't got a dust shield on it anymore. I don't even know if it's going to get any back again. Oh, it's still it's tight. Next thing, take this cap off. We've got to take this circlip off here. Right, we go and get some tools. Put your thumb over the end of the shaft and pull the, pull the circlip like this, and then it doesn't go boinging in your eye or all over the floor. And then the next important thing is to collect the shims. Now there might be one, there might be two, but they are very, very important. Don't lose them. Next thing, 17mm, we're going to take this flange off. With the bolts off, we're going to now try and get that flange off. I say try. Should come off. There we go. There we go. Make sure all the bolts are out.
get the flange off. Um, I probably can't see down there, but I've got a drip tray just in case there's any oil and dirt. <coughs> Next thing. <coughs> Excuse me. We need to clean up this uh, face of this here, and then we can see the hub nut. Oh, I'm not talking about hub nut with his 2CV. We can see here where the um, lock washer goes over. So what we're going to do is take that lock washer off. I'll go and get a chisel. With the lock washer out the way, tap it back with your chisel, taking care not to damage the nut. Next, take off the hub nut. I'm using this, uh, what size is that there? 52mm brick part socket. It's quite good actually. Yeah, that was tight. <laughs> Take the nut off. It's always handy to have. Uh, paper and rags and stuff like this, like paper towel. This is why I get through so much bloody paper towel. Right, take that off. Then you want a little screwdriver, which I've put down somewhere, now I can't find. Yeah. Take out the tab washer. They are a bit tricky sometimes to get out. It's even tricky when you're not looking at what you're doing and looking at the screen. And then the other nut inside should be just sort of finger tight, which it isn't. Right, where's that socket gone again? I think there's a ghost in this place because. I can put things down one minute and then they've gone the next. Ah, here it is. Put it in a drawer. There you go. See, it should only be sort of finger tight. Make sure everything's as clean as you can. We've got to strip this down and clean it out. But if you're just going to change the rotors or the discs without stripping, you know, without doing the bearings, then. Uh, you want to make sure it's as clean as possible. So that goes back onto your uh, paper towel, fold it over like that, keep it clean because you're going to wash them, but keep it clean as possible. The next thing, this is how easy, it's quite easy but modern cars are a lot better because they actually keep the hub in place and the rotor is just bolted to this flange and then it's sort of offset round the back. It's a lot better idea. Again, so pull your, pull your bearing forward and that is it. So we're off to the bench. Once we're on the bench, we can take the bearings out at the front and then we're going to clean off as much of that grease as possible. You can see it's kind of watery as that. Not watery, but it's very thin, very light. So we get rid of that. We get through a lot of paper towel here. Flip it, and then we're going to try and get that seal out of there. Notice the way it goes in. It's not sort of normal, it's, it looks backwards but it isn't. We're going to get our seal puller. I don't know if you saw, oh, did you say that? I'll do it again. Let me do that again. Let me get a hammer. I'll put this seal back in because you didn't see it. So we get our, <laughs> it's cheating isn't it, get our seal puller and just give it a lift. Now these are worth the weight in gold, go and get one for pulling seals out of all descriptions. Naturally we can't use it again, but there you go. So then what we're going to do is take the back, seat, back bearing out, we're going to cover it over like that look, don't get any more dirt on it. The next thing, I'm going to take all that much much of that grease out as we can. Again, using paper towel. Paper towel is a lot better than rags in this instance because 
They're a lot easier to throw over next door's fence than uh, rags. And what we're going to do is we're going to inspect the uh, the races and see what they're like before we take the disc off. So I'm going to wash this out now. Now the hub's all nice and clean. We're looking for signs of damage in this hub, in these bearings. There doesn't seem to be much, but on one section I noticed here, the bearings have sort of started to develop little lines in them. I don't know if you can see. Little spots right there. That's See there, look. It doesn't look too good. Let's flip this over. Now you see this one's completely different. See it's it's more even. I mean it feels nice and I could pull that back in again. But seeing we've got a bearing kit, well tell me the expense, we're gonna put some bearings in, we've got some genuine Timkin ones. One thing to notice about this, which is uh, while I've got the camera here. Notice the difference, you know, you see there's a space here and here. But this is a particularly bad idea. There's not much distance between the bearings. The bigger the bearing distance, the, the more stronger that's going to be. It's less likely to tip, if you see what I mean, and wear. Um, the old series were well apart, you know, the, the, this piece here. They were a lot wider, but um, I think it's all because they wanted to put mag wheels on and they had to shave some space down from somewhere I'm not really sure but they were saving space and that was the price they had to pay it's uh, it would be a lot better if, especially when you've got great big mag wheels on and great big tires there's a lot of force on those two bearings when they're turning if you see what I mean not turning this way but axially when they're moving like this right now I'll tell you what I'm gonna do first of all what the hell is that thing there Poop. Um, we're going to get these off and these are spline bolts again and I'm not sure what size they are I think they could be 12 millimeter I'm not sure I'll confirm that in a second just hold on well I was telling lies it's actually 14 millimeter so just make sure they go off these spline bolts are okay until you round them off. Take them out. See, notice they're not rusty. That's a good thing. The next thing we've got to do is press that hub out. We're going to support this in two blocks of wood on the uh, press and push it out. Some people hammer them out. I don't, I'll press them. Just before we finish this section, I just want to point something out. Kind of interesting. Look at this side of the rotor. Lovely, all nice and even. But if you look on the back side, you can see it's not polished at all. There's dark spots, there's bits where pads have been. It doesn't look very nice at all. Now, naturally, there's no markings on these rotors, so these look like they're aftermarket ones. Well, Chinese ones. But I don't know whether the, the metal is different, not on both sides, but it, it's got some sort of deform, um, defect in the metal. I don't think it's the, the caliper. In fact, you know, when I run my fingers around like this, you can feel just a little tiny bit of difference on there. Weird. This is okay. It's just here. Wonder, wonder what caused that. Anyway, I don't want to. I don't really want to know. <laughs> All right. So I've got my press set up. Two nice blocks of wood. So this hubs off the. There's a distance between here, and I found a a nice sole socket that fits nice and snug inside there. Well, that was easy, wasn't it? I could have knocked it out with a hammer. But sometimes, 
these are a bugger to get off so yeah copper grease nice see that's why I should put copper grease on things but you never know right back to the bench to get the bearings out an old chisel sometimes the good manufacturers the quality manufacturers put a little groove in so you can get a punch in but obviously this is Land Rover and they don't do that because their cars never go wrong apparently do it from 180 degrees just keep tapping knock knock knocking try not to try not to chisel the uh, the inner, inside of the hole Is that one? Now you have to be a bit careful here knocking this one out because you don't want to knock the studs out if possible but anyway you could do it on a press but they are quite easy to get out And no marks, no damage onto there. Those bearings were there, by the way. MNR. Never heard of MNR, have you? They've been replaced. MNR. Wonder who they are. Right. So now we're going to have a look inside this hub and inspect it. Now when we've been chiselling and taking things out, we might have made some little burrs on the face. Not on this, not on this roundy bit here, but on the square bit where the bearings face onto. Like that. So, if you have a little tippet is to turn your chisel backwards and knock, them, and knock them back out again so they're nice and flat now this is my old chisel, look at that it's seen better days, I think Noah had it before and uh, if you see any raised bits knock them back it's better for them to be knocked in than sticking out because it will make the bearings difficult to seat and then we must inspect everything these, are, these have been out a few times before There's lovely. So I'm going to wash this off and then we'll fit the bearings. The bearing kit we're going to fit is a brick part kit DA2381G and it says OAM on it. You should sometimes say OMG if you don't know what you're going to get. Right, let's have a look. Oh, I'm going to get some more paper towel. So, first of all we get a bearing grease. That is totally insufficient for the job. We need a bit more than that. We get a gasket. Hurrah. Ooh, look, we get a new end cap. Oh, they hey, they tell you, some of these kits are really going to town now. They didn't used to have all this lot in before. Ah, you see, that's the nut. That's the lock nut for the TD5. Because it says on here, wheel bearing kit, Defender LA onwards. That's uh, 300 TDI onwards. We don't need that. We can. Oh, look, it's even a circlip for the end of the shaft. 
I think this has got everything you want. Now it's only obviously got one lock nut and one tab, but one lock nut's better than nothing, I suppose. It's got a Cortico wheel, wheel bearing, uh, wheel bearing, oil seal. That's good brake. Oh, look, it's got the bolts as well. Timkin bearings. Where are they made? Probably in France. But we've got five new bolts with Loctite on, so we've got everything we need to do that hub. Timkin France. That's good. So we'll put that up there. And we'll supply it will commence to do the bearing. Right, I'll just go and get the hub. This socket from a GM truck, or is it a Ford truck? I don't know what it is. But it's absolutely perfect because it's an ideal size to put those bearings in. Now I could go across to my press and press these in. But I'm going to tap this in with a hammer, um, just like you guys would do. Now we've got to be clean at this point, so we're going to give our hammer a bit of a rub. Give here a bit of a rub. And this is how you do it at home. Always keep looking. And keep it square. Now, when you hear it go like that, a harder knock, you know that the bearing is seated. It will not go any further. And it's nice and square. Alright, so we, 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 you know, listen to that. That's what we're lis li listening for. So now I'm going to do the other side bearing. I'm not going to touch that. Just wipe off any excessive dirt. Give it a flick. Clean the inside. Make sure there's no dirt on the on the face. Got to be clean. At this stage, if you're dirty and your bearing's falling on the floor, well, you shouldn't be doing the job. So let's open the other bearing. Now remember, this is the back one. This one's the, the back bearing, this one's going to be the front bearing. So we put it at different places on our bench, we'll put all the... Because I like to keep the bearings together. I know they're not run in together, but sometimes when you open a packet you like them to be matched to the same place. Again, give everything a, a clean. Hammer. Now hold the hammer at this end, not at this end. You want as maximum force as you can to get that in. Now square it up. There. You hear that difference in note when you know it's down? Now, why it's nice to use a big socket or something like that, a big tube, is because you're hitting all the way around. If you're hitting it uh, with a chisel, going ding, 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 knocking it in, there is a tendency you can tip it over a little bit, and you probably won't know. And I think like 90% of bearing failures is due to the races not being fitted properly. It's a real pain. Anyway, now we can flip that over, and now we can fit the hub, uh, the uh, disc rotor. Thing, roundy thing. Clean that off. We'll go and get some anti seize and we'll go and get a rotor. I get through loads of that stuff. I should be sponsored by him. The rotors we fit in today are Delphi ones. We're not gonna we're not gonna fit them Chinese ones ever again. Now again this has got to be nice and square and you see how easy it fitted onto the hub? You know, that's what you want. So I like to turn them just a wee bit, like that, not like that, like that. And uh, it sort of beds them down and it feels really, really nice. So the next thing we're going to do is put the bolts back in. 
And I like to put a little bit of Loctite on them. I'll just go get my Loctite. Which I am running very short of. Talking about running short of, I'm running short of time. It's quarter past down six. There we go. Only wants a bit on. Whoops, not that much. Now I'm just going to whiz these down with a gun. And then I'm going to... Um, I'm going to top them down properly. So I'll go and get the airline. So now I'm going to put this in the vise, the hub in the vise. I don't clamp it by the rotor itself, that would be pretty stupid. And I'm going to tighten down the bolts. 54 foot pounds it says. Just go around them and check them once they're down to tightness. Good. Don't forget to back your torque wrench off once you've used it. Now, uh, let me see. Running out of paper towel because I've just used all my stuff. What you can't see, what I can see, Maybe not. Maybe, maybe a little zoom at maybe. Mm. You can see where somebody's been hammering on this lip to, to break off the rotor before. They've really been belting it out. There's no need really. Just press it or do something. Put it in a door frame, <laughs> in like your house door frame, and push it out. I don't know. So what we're going to do now? We're going to clean those inner races. And we're going to fit the sail. Fit the bearing, then fit the sail. The grease supplied with the kit isn't really very adequate. It's not much at all. So I used to. I like to use this red bearing grease that we get from our local shop. We just make sure there's no dirt in it. I try to keep it as clean as possible, but we're getting a bit short now. So we'll give it a head start by greasing up all the bearing on the inside and really forcing and packing grease as much grease into there as we can you know into the bearing itself I'm afraid you have to get your hands dirty for this one but we don't mind that do we we're all dirty buggers right so some grease in there Make sure that the uh, it's, it turns nice, there's no uh, bittiness. And next we're going to fit the seal. Now, new roll of paper towel. I want you to observe something, the difference in quality between the seals. Because this is a genuine Cortico seal. And I was just noticing something very interesting. I'll read it out to you because you can't see it. It says here, this way to the stub axle. This way to the stub axle. So that means it fits like that. Not only that, it says, fit to depth of four millimeters. Four millimeters. Now, the cheap seals that you get don't have that, so and sometimes you're very tempted to put them in backwards. And they're going like this, look. Right? Now, you can actually push them in by hand. But I have a little tool for that. Hey, wait a minute. I might even have a better tool. I wonder if this tool will fit in the bearing will fit. No, no, it's a bit too, bit too small. So wait a minute. Well, I just put the seal in there. You didn't see it, but I used this tool that I had made. Now, this is for the older type of seals, and it's not all that accurate because it actually gauges the depth to put the seal in, so this fits on the outside. Well, this is for the earlier type of seals. 
but it doesn't really matter. I, I put it in too far and I got it to four millimeters depth all the way around. But you know, you can make one of these, somebody can turn you one of these up quite easily. So that's that done. Well, or alternatively, just get your little ruler and go around and make sure it's four millimeter. I mean, it is quite an easy thing to fit in. Right, so I'm happy with that now. That's done. Right, so that's that. So the next thing is to fit the front bearing in the same fashion. Let's do it now because I'm going to run off for supper in a minute. Pass me tea time. <laughs> Now again, if we see any particles or little bits and burrs and things like that, take them out, take them out straight away. Again, load up your bearing, give it a head start, don't put them in dry. By God, I've seen people put these in dry and... I wonder where the bearings go. A lot of people complain, so, oh, brick part bearings, oh, they're no good. I've never had one fail yet. I think if you do the correct procedure for fitting bearings, even crappy bearings are not too bad. It's just that you think, oh, they're cheap, I won't really bother. And you'll just nail them in. But, you know, you can see how I'm forcing grease in through the thick bit so it comes out through the rollers. So we know it's all tight. Now, before we put the bearing in, Get a splodge of grease and put it round the uh, the race. So it, again, so it's not dry. And put the bearing in and seat it down. Ooh, that's lovely. Now, last thing I like to do is get a nice big splodge of grease in the middle in the cavity. Now, word of word, word of warning, and you know some of you guys, you old guys, you all know this. Do not fill the cavity inside full to the brim of grease. It will overheat. 75% grease maximum. All right. Don't put much more in because it will overheat. It needs, it needs places to, to move and things like that. So I'm going to get my hands cleaned up. We're going to fit that hub on. So once you've got your stub assembly on, carry your bearing, carry your hub assembly with your thumbs in the middle like this and slip it on the hub. Now before we do that I'm going to just show you something. Oh, that doesn't fall over. Inspect here where the oil seal is for any cuts, knocks, burrs and rips because it'll just rip the oil seal to bits. If this piece is damaged in any way at all, or if the hub here is damaged in any way at all, replace it. You've got to replace it, take them five bolts out of there and replace that assembly. On the old series trucks you could actually knock this piece off, this collar, but you can't unfortunately this. They just want you to buy a new one. So, let's uh, Let's give it a head start with some grease. Forgot to put that on, well, I didn't really, but I put some grease, I'm showing you guys, but I actually put some seal, some grease in the hub uh, seal itself. So let's put it on. Oh, look at that. Perfect, eh? Next thing, we're gonna get all the bits and pieces to go in there. The next piece we're gonna fit is this steel washer with the flat on it and that goes between the bearing and the first lock nut. Now I put some grease on it the reason we put grease on it is it, so it gives it a nice surface for the nut to go against. I've, I'm using the old nuts because they were absolutely perfect there was no... some people chisel these on and off it's not really the right thing to do. Now this is a bit of a tricky subject how you tighten these bearings down Different people have different ways. I do them like this. I tighten them up by hand and I spin the wheel. Oh, that's a bit nicky. Spin the wheel. 
in the wheel to set the bearings down. Tighten it up with finger tight like that. They say you put a DTI on and make sure that you know get a certain amount of play. However, for a lot of inspection stations, they don't allow that. They want the bearings to be really tight. So what I do, I get my socket and I turn this and I keep turning it till I can't turn it anymore. In both hands, back it off, turn it till my hands slip on the socket. See? Turn it, your hands slip. That is perfect. Don't want any tighter than that. Next thing, we'll go and get the lock nut. In the bearing kit, uh, there comes a, there's a nut like this for a TD5. And the reason why we have this nut for a TD5 is between this, instead of having two lock nuts, between the bearings, there's a spacer. So you, you tighten this up to the specified torque and then pin this over so it locks onto the shaft. Um, and they're sort of a one-shot deal, unfortunately. You have to keep buying new ones. Um, the reason for that is so you can't make an error doing the wheel bearing tension. But So if the wheel bearing's a bit loose on a TD5, you can cheat a bit and turn a little bit off the uh, spacer in the middle and then tighten it up a bit more. Well, a lot of people have done that. Or new bearings all the time. These taper roller bearings are supposed to be adjustable anyway. So I put a little bit of grease on there, find the nut that I've lost, tighten it up and then we're going to put the, the hub nut on. All right. And now we're going to find what the torque is because I've just forgotten I've had a blank moment. So it's Sunday morning, we're back onto this job again. Lionel Richie was going to come round, but he's so easy, he's still in bed. Right, we set the torque wrench to 50 newton metres, and we're going to tighten up the outer hub nut. That's all it needs. It doesn't. People put great big bars on them and tighten them up, thinking they're going to come off. Well, they don't really. Next, oh, that feels so good, you know. That really does feel nice. I wish you were here. <laughs> Funny enough, I was just going to, I was going to mention that in all the years I've been doing Land Rovers, I've never had a wheel bearing fail there. Yeah, cheap ones, good ones. If you put them in right, they're okay. Right, so what we're going to do now is we're going to get our, hold of our little pry bar and pry forward this um, tab washer. I mean, it is tricky to do. And then I get, then I turn it the other way, and I force it back. See like that? Look, look how neat that is. And you don't need to get a, a great big chisel, except for when you're doing the one that locks over the back, because you do need a chisel for that. Now you have to sort of guess where it is. I try to do it. I don't do it next to the one I've tabbed over. I'll do it a couple over. So I'm going to get a feel, and there you go, once it goes, then we can get our little pry bar, I'll put it down some more, then we'll pry it down onto there, if it will. It's going down, but I think the chicken's going to help it. Nah, that's better. So a chisel, a little pry bar is good for doing this one. Now, a lot, you, so what you do is you bend one over the back nut and one over the front nut and lock them together. I've seen people just, just lock over the front one and not bother with the back one. Well, now it's all locked in place and that's why you don't need a massive amount of torque. Because those two nuts are sort of jammed together, like when you screw one on top of the other, it won't move. And that's really nice. So the next thing, we're going to clean out these holes for the bolts. I don't know how we're going to do that, but we'll think of something. Just wait a minute. I'll have to go and get my blow gun. Can you 
you see when I washed off, wash this off in the parts washer, you can see there's sort of rubbish coming out. Now we haven't finished yet. Oh no. What we're going to do is carefully wash them out with some brake cleaner. You always miss this out on. Uh, you always miss this out, and there's a reason for it. And again, blow it out. So, what's the reason? The new bolts that we're going to put in. I've got Loctite on them. You can see there, look, there's got a bit of Loctite on. If you put Loctite on with, with, when it's greasy and it's not dry, well, you might as well not bother because it's not going to do anything. It needs to be really dry. So that's what we're going to do next. We're going to grab hold of the gasket and, and slip it onto the flange when I find the flange. Oh, here it is. So we'll just discard the old bolts, get rid of them, and then we'll clean off the old gasket and get rid of this grease. Once we're happy the threads are all nice and clean inside, we prepare our flange, we'll put some grease on the inside, and one of the most important things is to test the spline. These flanges are pretty cheap. If you're anywhere suspicious of them, change them. Now on the back bearings, these are notorious for going on. The back wheels, should I say. These are notorious on TDIs for chattering about. So what I do is I put the flange on backwards and see if there's any play. There should be no play at all. If there is play, if it's all loosey-doosey, you'll have to change the, the spline, either the half shaft or the CV, and the flange, you must do them as a matching pair. So I've put the gasket on and I hold the gasket on in this instance with grease, but try not to put any grease in the holes. Alright? And the reason is when, when we've got some grease we can put plenty of grease on those splines inside and it's also got some grease on the outside. And the grease will help prevent water getting in. You know, it's really important. So we put some grease on these splines here. You see, on the old series trucks and the older Defenders, when they had this wider flange, the, uh, the oil from the axle sort of managed to creep down and oil the bearings and stuff, but on these newer ones it doesn't. It's, it's all, uh, how do we say, uh, relies on grease and the problem is the, the, the oil, no lubricant can get into the spline. It's a really bad idea uh, and it just relies on grease. Well if you've got a car that's 30 years old that grease is going to dry out unless it's regular maintenance. But then again the reason why we're doing this and putting Loctite and anti-seize and stuff like this is you have to strip the caliper down if you need to change the rotors or the discs. We're of a pain so never mind. That's what we're up against. So, now we're going to turn the wheel and put our bolts through just before we fasten up the flange. That will give the gasket a little bit of time to, to move, if you see what I mean. Uh, all that. Try not to get grease on these bolts. It's a really tricky situation to be in because you don't want to get to grease on that Loctite. But then again, you need grease for lubrication. What a, what a nightmare. So, we'll put those bolts in. There we go. Now we're not going to tighten them down yet. There's a reason for that too. There's a reason for everything. But This is why we don't put sealer on here, because we'll, by the time we've messed about doing them, all these bolts up, then... Uh, if you put like silicone on here, it'll be dry. So we can push that in. Uh, so, so the next thing we're going to do is just wind those down a little bit 
I'll, I'll go off camera to do that. I'll wind them down but won't torque them down yet and you'll see why. With those bolts just sort of nipped up tight but not torqued up tight, the next thing we're going to do is find the tool that I need. I'll just put it down. Ah, here we are. We're going to put the circlip on the end of the shaft and the shim. Now, what's the shim for? Well, let me explain. This is the tool I'm going to use. It's a 7 16th UNF bolt bent over to a little handle and you wind it in the thread like that look and then pull pull the shaft out. You can see it goes in and it comes out. Now if you forget to put the shims in or you don't put the right size shims in when you when the CV goes in like this it will limit the amount of travel on the hub and the hub the CV will start eating into the hub, not good, and you'll find lots of metal particles in there, so that's not good. So you pull that out. Now, the proper way to do it, if you've got no shims, is to pop your circlip on, and by doing this you can leave your circlip on there and it won't go anywhere. Put your circlip on, and then with some feeler gauges, I'll do it like this and then you can see. These are the wrong circuit plates, they're far too small, but it's all I could get hold of. So, get that onto there, and then with your shim, should be a nice snug fit behind there. Just a little tiny bit of play, not too tight, not too loose. So you can get some feeler gauges measure the distance between the circlip and the, the flange and put the corresponding amount of shims in. Um, these shims come in all different sizes, some thick, some thin, but this one is, is just perfect. This was the original one so it works very very well. So I'm going to take that circlip off again, like so, with the wrong set of pliers, like that. Put the shim on, like that. And then put the circlip on and make sure it snaps in because it hasn't snapped in at the bottom one. There. And then just turn them around a little bit like that just to make sure it's in. And then that's just right, you know, you don't want it too tight, you don't want it too slack, that's perfect. Take your shaft out, your, your, your special tool. Now these are all different threads but I found a a 7 16th UNF sort of works okay. Um, next thing, again, a bit of grease in the cap and then force it on. Now, these that can be bloody tight. Ooh, that is tight. What was Mr. Brick Bar thinking of this one? Bloody hell, I'm going to get a hammer to that knock that on. Have I got one here? One second. I just used my rubber mallet to put that on. There we go. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing when they're too tight? When they're too tight, they're going to seal nice. But when they're too tight, they're going to eventually split because it is rubber and it's, well, it's rubbery type plastic type stuff and it's not going to last all that long. So, you can't win, can you? The next thing we're going to do is do the same for our... Uh, we're going to put the caliper on. We're going to clean... The bolt holes for the caliper. Breathe all those fumes in, isn't that nice? And then we're going to go and look for our Loctite. I'm not really organised for this today at all. So we've got the uh, some th some thread locker on the bolts. They've been dried off. And now we're going to put the caliper on and put the bolts in now. These are a bit tricky to get in. Let's see if I can pull this around a bit. They are a bit tricky to get in. But not impossible. There we go.
So I'm going to spin those down and then we'll get the torque wrench out. So with those nipped down, the correct torque is 82 newton meters. I must really get myself a new torque wrench because I can't hardly see this on here. Uh, that's about it. So what we've done now is we've jammed a screwdriver in the vent <laughs> the disc like that because it's easy and we're going to tighten down the bolts here to 65 newton meters. Lots of people whack these on with air guns so tight and then they start to either strip the threads which is rare but they can snap the bolts inside. I've, I've seen so many snapped. The thing is if you have to do any field repairs on these things if it's all done to the right torque the bolts are easy to get out. And Like yesterday when we did that uh, water leak and pea gasket and things like that they just whacked everything up with a gun we don't care until it's time to take things out. But by doing a job like this where it's all talked up properly, you know you can get the bolts out. And also, we've used the, like, the correct procedure by putting uh, anti-seize on this disc. So if this disc does go wrong in the future, you can see how easy it is to pop it off. You don't have to hammer them. Oh, that's really crude. So that's nice. The next thing, what we're going to do is force back the pistons and fit the new pads. Now, I've already forced back these two here, but you maybe can see a little bit of drips of uh, brake fluid coming out. Let me see. There you go. Now, why do we do that before we put the pipe on? <laughs> well, because you can see how easy it is to force the brake fluid back out with instead of fighting to push all the fluid back up the system. Um, we're going to bleed this through anyway. I'm going to show you how to do that. So the pistons are all back. This is feeling really nice. We're going to fix the brake pads. Well, it seems I made a bit of a faux pas and uh, lost the last few scenes, so I'm having to redo this again. Uh, so what I've <laughs> what I've done is I've taken the pads out again to show you how I put them in and what I'm just going to talk about. So if you see anti-seize all over here. It's not because we've skipped anything, it's just that, well, it didn't turn out. What I've done is I've put the brake pipe back on. I bled it through from the pipe here. All I did was open the bleed screw and just let it pour into a ball and then nip it up. It's like I do it all the time, just gravity feed it. It pours out lovely. The next thing, the pads that I'm using, I always use Frodo. I've had good uh, service out of Ferrodo. This is the part number for the 300TDI 110 front. Now I've got a feeling TD5s and a lot of cars are very much similar to this. I've had very very good results from Ferrodo. Uh, I used to be a big Mintex guy. I used to like Mintex pads but there was a problem with them. I think they changed the formula because, or they did something different, because in the, when, if I put any other make of pad in the back of Land Rovers, apart from Ferrodo, they screech. The vehicles with disc brakes screech like a banshee. They're terrible. Um, I don't know what it is, but I've put Ferrodo in, not a problem. Not a problem at all. So that was, that's one of the things. But like I say, they're, they're around about the same price, they last quite well, they break well. 
but like I say, Ferodo's the, the guys for me now. So what I'm going to do with these, I'm going to give them a, a coating all the way around with uh, anti-seize. And anti-seize in this instance is going to do two purposes. It's going to act as a lubricant and it's also going to stop these corroding. Now, a couple of things. On these new style pads, they've got a chamfer at the bottom, and that's where they go, at the bottom here. Don't put them upside down, like that would be no good at all. So, left and right, put the chamfer at the bottom, so just pay attention to that. Because some, some of the earlier Ferodos, even though it had the same part number, doesn't have this chamfer in. Now, a couple of things to watch. When you put the pad in, just make, sh just make sure that there's no wear in the caliper at the bottom. Now these pads have got a, like a semi-circular fixing in there and, and that means it's sort of like self-aligning so it'll turn a little bit, it'll move a little bit. But because it's got slotted holes in, they, are, they can, on earlier cars and older cars, allow to move. Um, they do this, the chatter. And the chattering gets worse and worse and worse. And um, what happens is you build up a ridge inside, like there's a groove, should I say. There's a groove inside on the caliper. And it makes it harder to press the pads. You know, they'll still work, but it makes them harder to press the pads. The pedal's hard, but you don't do, you, your braking's not very effective. So if you've got chattering pads, you know, they're doing this, it doesn't necessarily mean you need to put better springs in or anything like that. Just check inside the caliper and make sure there's no grooves inside there, all right? Calipers are relatively cheap. Um, these were genuine AP Lockheed ones. These were expensive, but, well, you get what you pay for. So that's that. So I've, I've already pre-greased this one. Well, you know, not grease. Don't put any grease on this bit. That's no good. Doesn't matter if you get grease on this outside -y bit. That's all right. And put them in like that. Now, like I say, I've already got these greased up. We can put the pins through. Now, what I did was I got the brush and I put anti-seize all the way through there, through the pinholes, because they get subject to so much, you know, water and salt and stuff like this. And they seize up, so it's best if they come out, because brakes, you know, they don't last forever. But, you know, I've seen guys punching these pins out and they snap these brackets off the calipers and then they're knackered. Oh, there's all sorts of problems. The, 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 the pins and the things, the pins and the springs, etc., that came with these, that we took off, were very, very good. There was no need really to change them. And this is what I was going to say about this job. The bearings didn't really need changing all that much. But I had them and he wanted new pads in, so uh, new bearings in, so I put them in. I put genuine bearings in. But nine times out of ten, the bearings are fine. You just have to look at the um, look at the races, look at the rollers, and see if there's any marks on them. They should be almost like new. But there will be sort of a obviously wear marks and stuff like this, you know, where it's been running. So that's that, that's the pads in, that's all you have to do. I know I digress and get off track. So what I've done also, if you notice at the top here, I put some grease, after I bled this through, I put some grease all the way around here and forced it into the hole of the bleeder. Uh, that's to stop, again, to stop any water and rubbish getting into there. So next time you want to bleed them through, it's going to be fine. One crucial thing you've got to look at when you're doing your brake pads or doing anything on your brakes, you're moving the pipes out of the way. This top pipe here has been replaced. What you've got to do is make sure that when you turn, turn your wheel, you know, left and right, and make sure this pipe isn't touching the spring. It's very easy to do. I mean, uh, you know, this one isn't touching here. And if I turn it the other, I don't suppose I can turn it the other way, isn't it? Well, it's hard. It's very hard. Wait a minute, I'll go on the other side and you'll see.
there, where will it? So you can see here, I, I, well you probably can't see, but I can get my fingers between the spring and the pipe and that's good, that's a good thing. Make sure this pipe here, the flexible pipe, isn't going to be catching the spring when that's going up and down. You don't want to nip that because you've got no brakes. So, that's that. Now, we're almost done now. The crucial thing is, whenever you've done your brakes, before when you leave it, let it off the jack, press the pedal down. Make sure that the pads are going to be touching the discs before you drive it anywhere. It, the first stroke of your pedal will go right down to the floor so keep pumping it and the, the pedal will come up to the top so once you've done that obviously you're going to fill up the, the, the pistons the, the caliper is going to fill up with fluid you must go and top up the master cylinder it's very important, a lot of people forget that so top up the master cylinder, pump the brake up and then we find, and then the lastest job of all, the lastest of all jobs we do is we wash off the, the rotor. This isn't to make sure it goes rusty very quickly, it's just to get all the grease and stuff off. Now, I usually leave this section right till last because obviously you've got brake, uh, you've got brake fluid, you've got grease, you've got anti-seize and it's nice to get it off at the last thing. Now, you'll notice too that this disc is missing the dust shield at the back. Now this is a bit of a controversial thing. Land Rover put them on, but they're rusted like crazy. Uh, and then they're catching the brakes and they make a screeching noise and things like this. Do they do in, do those uh, dust shields actually do anything at all? Well, good question. Most of the time they catch stones in and they get stones in the back and they make a, make a screechy type noise. But these have fallen off. They haven't lasted all that long. Is it worth buying new ones? Well, I, I really don't know. Um, it's two schools of thought. First of all, it protects the uh, disc, but the second school, school of thought is, well, if the disc's open, well, dirt's going to just fall off and it's not going to accumulate behind that uh, dust shield. I really don't know. So the customer said, oh, I'll just leave them off, so I'm going to leave them off. We'll have an experiment and see how it goes along. So there you go. While it's up in the air, while we're doing this job, I'm going to have a, a look around and a look-see to see if there's any uh, problems with bushes, uh, ball joints, anything that's loose. We're going to check them out. Now, I'm just looking at this bush down here and I'm noticing it's, uh, it's rusty for some reason. I think I might just get my pry bar and put that in there. Oh, no, that's all right. That's, that's had poly bushes in, but it seems to be awful dry compared to the rest of the arm. But it seems to be all right. Let me check the front. Oh, the front's all right. Hmm. I don't know why that is. Anyway, that's how we do the calipers, the brakes, and change the bearings. The front and the back is almost identical. The 2.5s. To, you know, 300 TDIs, 200 TDIs, it's all variants on a theme, it's the same idea. Just be very clean when you do the bearings, make sure those seats, the bearing races are very nice and square and into this housing, the, into the hub. If the bearings, instead of being nice and, nice and sort of parallel, if there's one kicked over, that's when you're going to start getting bearing problems. But it could only be a thousandth or two of an inch, and you, you might not notice it. But uh, push those races in square. The rest will all sort of balance out quite nicely. But And make sure also that you're using a good quality grease. I didn't use the grease that came with the, with the stuff. I've, I'm quite happy with the grease that I've got in, uh, in my, red, my red grease. It didn't seem enough quantity in the, the brick part grease to do a full bearing. Um, 
maybe they've engineered it that way to, you know, said that's enough, but I don't know. No more than 75% in that hub, all right? Remember that. And just keep double checking everything. And again, can't emphasize too much. Before you jump in the car, pump up the pedal, all right? So I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you found it interesting. I hope you found it as some sort of, some bits and pieces out of it that'll be helpful for you in the future. Because this is going to make your Land Rover better. All right, so we'll see you in the next video. Bye now.